face an existential crisis that may bring human civilization to an end. This needs a whole of society effort to try and resolve it. Our current system is a planet killing Ponzi scheme. It's a giant casino of absolutely epic proportions. The consumer way very easily debauches. I think we are losing the sense of community in many ways. We, we need to learn about this fundamentals of a deeper connection to one another and to nature. Maybe there's another option, maybe there's another way, way to live which isn't the way that I have grown up with or become accustomed to or, or just fallen into. The story of industrial civilization tells us that limitless economic growth, advanced technology and material affluence are the pathways to prosperity. But as we reflect on the world today, it is clear that this is failing both people and planet. We know this in our heads and feel it in our hearts. And yet, it seems we have not found a new story by which to live. We are the generation in between stories, desperately clinging to yesterdays, but uncertain of tomorrows. But then again, perhaps the new story is already with us. Perhaps we just need to live it into existence. Uh, I came because I was looking for a way to simplify my life. I knew that the way that I was living my life wasn't right and the things that seemed that it seemed necessary to strive for weren't the things that I really wanted to strive for. And I've always felt that. Beautiful windows. So I guess for the last five or six years I've sort of been paring back. I felt I just yeah, I felt I didn't want to have debt. Um, I didn't want to um, didn't want to feel obligated to work a 40 hour week and not have time to do the things that really mattered to me. Um, so for the past year or so I've been experimenting with um, I guess living simply, living sustainably and trying to challenge myself I guess to live in a way that is less uh, harmful towards the planet and uh, less energy intensive. I guess I feel like this experiment is an opportunity to push myself a little bit further and um, challenge not only myself but the modern environmental movement to yeah, come to understand what it is to live sustainably. I'm really looking forward to this year being part of a team working together to explore uh, what it really means to live simply and sustainably, um, to work towards living within the resources of one planet, how we can just improve constantly. And I'm really excited about sharing that beyond the group here and beyond um, this place as much as we can. The idea of this project really interested in me, me because I've been trying to apply these principles in my own life in quite an individual way. Um, hadn't had much support from the wider group of people I was with, so the idea of coming here to be in a supportive learning environment and to be meeting lots of new people who are asking similar questions, challenging things in a similar way, that was, that's what excited me, that idea of working as part of a larger movement. Uh, I guess my interest in this project was to join with like-minded people, um, learn some skills, give my daughter the opportunity of 
living living on a on a rural property, um, being part of a documentary to to educate and inspire others to one planet living, sustainable living. Um, so I was interested in this project because it provided me the ability to put the theories of natural building and natural food production um, into practice on a much bigger scale than um, I'm able to do in cities and without actually buying any land because the land is so expensive at the moment. I've been studying permaculture for a long time but I'm excited to put into practice. I want to have it um, experiences and I want to be able to use my hands and have knowledge from experience rather than from books. In terms of the existing infrastructure um, in addition to the house um, there, there's a small earth ship, Cobb Roundhouse, um, some basic composting facilities uh, and a moderately sized farm shed if you like. My mother loved this place, so much so that my sister and I spread her ashes here once uh, she passed away. She is very much the seed for us in being able to explore sustainable pathways for the property. It was not long after this that I was introduced to Samuel Alexander's book Entropia and realised that uh, we were truly on the same page envisaging a simpler way. I shared all this with the Gunai Kurnai Land and Waters Aboriginal Corporation's Cultural Heritage Manager about our small Bragalung patch. And Wurrakan was born with permission to use Wurruk, a local indigenous word for earth and story, fused with Khan, the Mayan term for seed. We are beginning to build a tiny house. It's about 2.7 by 3.6 and about 3 metres high, so it's got a footprint of about 10 square metres. We're trying to use as much reclaimed timber and reclaimed iron as possible. For the last two or three months, I've been jumping into skips on the side of the road or jumping into people's backyards when they tell me that they're renovating or going to the tip shop or salvage yards or finding windows on the side of the road. We've got about 15 people here for the build over the, the next week. Uh, and at the end of that build, I'm hoping that we've more or less got ourselves a beautiful, unconventional, tiny house. tiny house that was built by a group of people in it was it was January as well so it took about a week and then I had to install some of the ceiling and a few other bits and pieces myself but it got finished in a week. So this is the outside of the tiny house it's made out of pretty much nearly all recycled materials building materials so it's probably about I would say about 95 percent all recycled building materials um, these weatherboards are actually skirting boards that we sanded down and varnished. So I guess that the main feature of the tiny house is the geodesic window. 
um, which our carpenter Nick made. It's beautiful. He actually made the frame and I cut all the glass um, and did the patterns. First time cutting glass and what do you know, it worked. And then I made a candle holder for it and everything. Um, this makes it a really warm and beautiful space to be in and I look forward to many winter nights with candles. Then we've got, like most tiny houses, we've got a loft for either storage or a bed. That's my bed up there. It's got a really cute little window. You can fit quite a lot of things into a, a tiny house and to be honest, it's quite comfortable. I've got my couch, my bed, I've got a workstation as well. This is my little desk where I end up doing designs from. Uh, which is a really beautiful place to work. I often work with the door open. I've got a view down into the valley there. Um, I often work uh, with a kerosene lamp, candles, sometimes a head torch if it's getting a little bit too dark. There's no power in the house and that's what I like about it. Um, I like to kind of go back to nature and it really gives you a feeling of the fluctuations of the seasons and the cycles of nature as well. I prefer to live in a tiny space. I like to nest and I don't think that you miss out on much, um, much more than living in a conventional house, in a quite a larger house. And that's because it makes you minimise, it makes you realise how much you don't need as well. It makes you realise how functional a small space can be. In our modern society, we have the usually the feeling that bigger is better and I don't necessarily think that that's the case. I think that smaller is more cosy and more nourishing. I grew up in quite a conventional way, um, in a little family in sort of suburban England but my family had a really strong connection to the natural world. We'd often go for walks in the forest and along moors and I had a deep love of nature from a young age. And when I was a teenager, I, through videos on the internet and through publications, discovered the extent of the ecological and social crisis happening in the world today, the deforestation, the pollution of the oceans, the toxic dumps at factory farming. That really hit me very hard. and. I became really concerned about how we were living. I had a deep sense that we shouldn't be going down that track, but at the time I had no idea that there was an alternative. What do we want? Climate justice! What do we want it? Now! You can't produce an answer unless you name the problem accurately. Unless we really understand the circumstances we're in, we're not going to get the solutions and find the path to it. And I've seen what I called, after Barbara Ehrenreich, a lot of bright siding. Uh, it's all happy clappy, it's all good, we're all going in the right direction, there's renewable energy, sunflowers, all of this. I think in part some of that is a personal psychological response of people wanting to talk about the good news because it allows them to go on. Um, but we have to deal with this problem as it really is and it is arresting and it is difficult and to pretend otherwise to pretend it's going to be light and easy, that it's going to be business as usual, everybody keep on making profit, we don't have to change much. To, to think like that actually means that we can't get to the solution we need. We need brutal reality in order to solve the problem. Techno-optimism in particular is, is really insidious. It's about telling us we don't actually have to change anything. We can still have everything we have now, so we don't really have to worry about any of these pesky limits. You know, we, we'll have everything we have now, we'll just do it all in a green sort of way. I think we have to have a recognition of the fact that we are facing limits and some sense of the relative time frame for the different limits that we're facing, because then we know what we're trying to prepare for and we have an appropriate kind of sense of urgency as to the need to do it. I hope that by the end of the year I'll have a deeper grounding in what it means to live simply and a greater confidence that this is in fact a way of approaching life that is deeply nourishing. I believe it is and the experiences I've had so far tell me that it is something that could be applied to lots of people's lives for great benefit. But I think the explorations of this year will 
helped give me confidence in communicating that message and sharing it with a wide range of people. I hope that by the end of the year these practical explorations will give me greater clarity of my own values and vision and how I see my life being a beautiful contribution to the difficult times that we're in as a species. I want my life to be a, a gesture towards uh, a more stable and loving world. I guess I'm expecting this year to be difficult. Um, I'm expecting to, yeah, again, push um, simple living to its um, probably more extreme ends and try and, I mean, I know that it's going to be uncomfortable, but I want to try and find out what my limits are and then maybe pair it back to something that's somewhere in between and more comfortable. Um, and I guess I've been doing that by myself for a little while now and I'm hoping to do that with a bunch of other people that are interested in the same kind of thing and maybe we can work together and as a community it might be more rewarding or more enjoyable or even a bit easier. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you can, can extend that to community living, um, I guess it'd be easier to extend to a much broader society. Oh, okay. No, it's not matching up anymore. I spent the last eight years working um, in an office as a town planner um, in a number of different roles doing different things. Um, and in the end of those eight years, I was actually partaking in projects um, that I was very passionate about. But the bulk of my work that was coming from up above, my bosses, um, was not something I was proud or um, really fully passionate about. Um, so quitting my job and um, doing a bit of traveling and then applying to be a um, part of this project um, gave me the ability to remove myself from um, the daily grind, I guess you could say. And, um, you know, I found that once I, you know, built my salary up over those eight years working from part-time to a full-time senior employee in a local government, um, I started spending that money on luxuries. And um, since I've quit my job, it's been nice to just strip all those things back um, and try and live more simply with um, far less. So over the year, I'm hoping that I'll be able to construct some form of abode on wheels for very little money as I don't have much, um, using recycled materials as much as I can. I've always had um, sort of uh, minor, minor health issues and in my mid-30s, they developed to a point where it was necessary for me to really do something to really take responsibility for my for my health because I wasn't finding um, the the medical profession um, helpful and I wasn't finding anything else that was helping me and so I started taking responsibility for my for my health and as I understood more about um, the way my body works and the the importance of the food that I put in it and that food is medicine and the importance of knowing where your food comes from um, and connecting with your food um, the more interested I became in, in soil and, um, and in gardening, which I'd never really, um, I mean I'd always been, always been a city girl, I never really knew how a strawberry grew. Um, wouldn't have recognised half the plants on my plate if I'd seen them in the garden. So those understandings led me to leave um, a desk job that I loved but which I realised wasn't healthy for me. It wasn't good for me to sit at a desk for five days a week, all day, every day. Um, it wasn't good for me mentally or physically or spiritually. Okay, so this is the Cobb Cabin. Um, it was built in a workshop about a year and a half before the project started. Um, it's, the walls are 30 centimetre thick cob which is um, sand, clay and straw and water um, and the floor is also cob. There's not a lot to show in the cob cabin because I, don't have, I didn't come with a lot of things um, so I haven't got much in here which, I really, which I'm really loving. I um, gave away or sold most of my things before I came to Australia for this project which was um, a really liberating experience. So obviously in the process of being here I've accumulated things because that's what we do. Um, one thing I've done is make a, a bed from um, pallets. There was some rocks left over from the build which and some planks lying around so I made some shelves um, from rocks and planks. I've got a little plastic solar powered light which doesn't put out much light. 
but that's uh, so that I don't have any other form of power in the cabin. Um, I'm not going to have any heating for winter. Um, the walls being 30 centimetre thick cob, it's, it's really well insulated, so it's really cool in summer. And so far it's been really warm on cool day on cold days, but obviously we're not in the heart of winter yet, so I don't know how it's going to be. <laughs> you need a certain level of material possessions to be satisfied, but beyond that point, which is surprisingly low, it's actually less about what we have and more about the way we live and the way we treat others and the way we feel ourselves to be in relationship with the wider world. And um, lots of beautiful writers spoke very clearly about how people can find more satisfaction in a less consumptive way, which at the same time makes us happier in the West, and it also reduces the load that we're putting on other people around the world who don't have um, access to the wealth that we're taking from them. So voluntary simplicity for me is a very elegant way to both increased personal satisfaction and sense of meaning and richness. There's now a mountain of literature that um, is overwhelmingly convincing that uh, not only are there savage limits to growth but we've gone through many of them in the sense that it is now utterly impossible for all people to live at anything like the standard of uh, consum consumption or environmental impact that we have in rich countries. Um, and yet the mainstream uh, has virtually ignored that case. The economy at the moment, despite all those brilliant tech fix things like the computerisation of everything, the resource use rates are going up at a fearsome rate. So if technical advance, technical fix is going to solve our problems, what I want to know is when's it going to start? And it often seems to me that these debates about our environment, our future and an you know, environmental future come down to uh, almost a blind faith in, in technology. And, and I, I should say that by background I'm a technologist. I come from an applied physics background. Uh, so you know, I, I like what technology does for us, but we have to be really careful about putting so much faith in this factor. Well, essentially all human political systems exist to extract wealth from the periphery and concentrate it at the centre. It's just that some of them do it a lot more effectively or efficiently than, than others. Capitalism does it extremely effectively. So it's a very effective mechanism for sucking wealth towards, uh, towards the centre. What you do is you create a Ponzi scheme essentially. You're, you're sucking everything in, but you constantly require larger and larger periphery to suck it into in order to keep expanding the capacity of the center. And if you can't keep expanding, it will collapse like any Ponzi scheme. So you have to keep reaching out further and further. I don't necessarily think it's certain that we're in for collapse or that it's happening now. Um, but I just think the evidence does appear to be assembling and stacking up uh, for that, we're, that it's likely that we may even be in the early stages of, of a collapse mode um, right now. Uh, it just makes sense to me to, to start to prepare and I, I suppose that, that to me means um, expect being more self-reliant. using organic gardening practices. So we're not using any pesticides, we're not using any fungicides, we're not using any chemical fertilizers, anything like that. It's mainly about trying to build soil in whatever we can, mostly with compost uh, and mostly with manures. Food is more than just fuel for the body. It's it's your connection to the land. It's the most food is the most intimate connection to the land because you interact with four of the five senses, you know, the taste and the texture and the smell and the sight. So it's quite an amazing thing 
to be able to enjoy good food, fresh food, seasonal food, real food. Food that doesn't come out of a can or a package and you mix water with it. Or I don't understand those type of food. The giant middlemen in the form of huge multinational corporations and supermarket chains are not able to treat farmers in a way that respects the absolute reality and necessity of diversity. These farmers are being pressured to grow standard size apples without a single blemish. They have to fit the machinery that is the harvesting machinery, the washing machinery, the supermarket shelf and the packaging. The end result is we burn tons of food every year. The end result is that the very research and development at university is now concerned about transportability and the looks of products, not the nutritional value. We don't know now when our food uh, naturally grows. You know, we get watermelons in June in, in Victoria. Like, watermelons don't grow in June in Victoria, you know? And I think that that's really disconnecting. When you wait for something to grow in your garden, it's a completely different feeling because you've anticipated it, you've cared for it. It not only tastes delicious, but you've got this kind of connection with it that makes it taste even more delicious. And the fact that you've waited for it all season. So we get some of our food from the garden, um, but during the winter we haven't had as much coming in from the garden. So we get some vegetables from um, the Bobo Food Hub. So we've been getting sacks of potatoes and sacks of carrots and sacks of onions from them, as well as garlic in bulk and things like butter and cheese. They also do veggie boxes um, with all a, re a range of different vegetables from the local area. So we've been getting them as we've um, progressed through the year. Um, aside from that, we get uh, our dry goods and other um, food from a variety of different places. So we're aiming to source our food as locally, ethically and organically as possible. So we, we choose which supplier we get different items from so that we're getting it from as close as possible and grown in the best way possible for the environment. Because to me, food consumption is a moral act. It is also a political act. And it is up to us, the consumer, or I like to call ourselves the citizens, not just consumer, to do something about it. Because we can't wait for authorities or government to do something about it. We just have to do things. It has to be from the bottom up. Uh, my name is Hayden and uh, I build Super Adobe Domes and uh, I run workshops and I hope to do it full time and as the real job. Uh, it's 3.6 metres uh, in diameter because that falls under the 10 square metre floor space uh, that it needs to be classified as a shed so we don't actually need a permit for it. Um, about 95% of the building material is earth. We've got a really, really large pile of earth that we've just pulled from the site here. So hopefully if your um, soil is the right consistency, uh, you get to use a really, really large percentage of soil that's on your site. So it's really, really local materials, really, really cheap, and um, yeah, really, really easy to build with.
yeah, this is our composting toilet setup, we, which we built over the course of a few weeks out of um, a combination of salvaged hardwood, um, local cypress, uh, which makes these, and yeah, some other um, materials that we found around the place, some hessian sacks from down the road. Um, it's a pretty simple system. There's uh, a urinal over on this side here and a um, composting toilet on this side. After we've finished using it, we put in a cup of sawdust um, just here from the local cypress mill, and that just helps it to, um, it balances the carbon and the nitrogen, and it helps it to compost into a fertilizer. So when we're done with the bin, when it's filled up most of the way, we'll um, take it out and uh, put it in a holding bay with um, all our other bins. And they'll sit for at least 300 days and we'll check on the compost after that time. Um, and during that time they'll just compost away and, um, until eventually they're um, yeah, beautiful fertiliser for the garden. We've used permaculture in the gardens where we're trying to maximise diversity and make sure that there's a lot of different kinds of plants around. We're planting herbs and things like that as well for integrated pest management. Permaculture can be defined in many different ways, but it basically uh, it stands for permanent agriculture, first of all, and then permanent culture. Okay, so the way I see it is it basically is planning and designing for more permanent kind of systems, uh, just like nature does really, it's mimicking nature. So it's utilising design and careful research and planning to ensure that you're creating a self-cycling system that's regenerative and produces no waste. So permaculture is really a design system for both sustainable land use and sustainable living. And so it's addressing both the production side of the conundrum and the consumption side and saying, why not bring those things back together? Well, we eat food, you know, why don't we grow a garden? Why don't we grow the food in the garden and integrate that whole rather than the industrial system which stretches everything out in these long supply chains? So bring it back together. And through that, a whole lot of design principles emerged that you know small scale systems actually make more sense than large scale ones that you need a diversity rather than a monoculture. And it's not just sustainable. Sustainable is not nearly good enough. What you need is not sustainable, you need regenerative. And that's exactly what permaculture provides you the ability to do. Rather than our extractive system where we've constantly been sucking resources out all the time and, and cannibalizing, catabolizing our natural capital all the time, rather than doing that and leaving ourselves less and less and less ability to produce and meet our needs in the future, if you institute a permaculture system, you're actually rebuilding that natural capital. Sustainability is a funny one. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's a bit of a buzzword at the moment. Sustaining. Um, yeah. I don't know what it is that you're trying to sustain anyway. I mean, yeah. When you think about sustainability, it means, I guess, that you can continue um, doing what you're doing, ongoing into the future indefinitely. Um, but I just don't really think that there's that much that we should be trying to sustain at the moment. We should be um, looking at solutions that can improve the land over the long term and can improve the lives of people. But um, I don't think the rampant inequality and the extreme concentration of wealth in the hands of the few is something worth sustaining. I think that's something worth destroying and challenging and replacing. And, you're really answering what is a deep human need because that's how we evolved. It's coming back onto a track that would allow life to continue evolving, that would allow for real progress. Um, the other path is suicidal. I mean, it, 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 we are going to soon get to the point where localize or die, basically because we cannot continue extinguishing species, cannot continue creating frustration, fundamentalism, terror. We cannot continue so blatantly destroying any form of democracy. You know, things are going to change and I think we'll see, um, you know, that people are waking up very, very rapidly to the benefits of localization.
All right, this week uh, we're retrofitting our existing farm shed to be a kitchen, lounge and uh, craft space. Um, we want a multifunctional large area that can be converted to different uses with portable bits of furniture. So um, with the materials we're using, we've sourced locally um, milled timber um, from a local sawmill and we're also using as many recycled materials as possible. So we've got a bunch of floorboards and bits of uh, iron that we're gonna use as cladding for the internal space. We're also gonna be doing um, a recycled bottle wall along the front of the building here. Uh, to let as much light in as possible and, and uh, that's also going to feature some large glass doors to bring the outside in and uh, feature that beautiful view we've got um, of the property. Um, there's, there's so much waste these days of buildings that are getting torn down or scraps of wood that are left over from building jobs um, that we can divert those resources from landfill and actually use them in a meaningful way and be really creative with um, just making something out of nothing. We're here at the Warakan uh, kitchen lounge room communal space, which uh, we've been living in now for about three or so months. I guess the theme starts with our recycled timber. Um, these ones up the top and, and on the side here are oak floorboards that were left over from a building project and, and we were able to get them very cheap. Um, we've got some recycled windows that there are a couple of sets around the room. So over here you can see we've used a combination of corrugated iron and some uh, hardwood fence palings that we were able to get for free um, from demolition. We also scored some of this splashback stuff around the sink and the, um, the oven which is heat proof and um, yeah that was left over commercially and we were able to get it for free. These beautiful bench tops, um, both these ones and the, the larger slabs came from a sawmill. Um, from Jedwood, we were very lucky to, uh, to get their offcuts and be able to actually use them with the help of our professional carpenter to, uh, to get them to this stage, which is really nice. Up on the roof, we've actually had to use some plywood. Um, we were a bit short on materials to do the whole thing with reclaimed stuff. And there's also insulation and, uh, and framing um, behind all of these walls and the ceiling now. Um, so that, that insulation was also you know, a bit of a compromise. We bought that new as well because that can be pretty hard to find secondhand. Uh, it's been really great to have a wood-fired stove to cook on. Um, it feels a lot better than cooking with an electric stove as we were before. Um, just knowing that the source of energy that we're using to cook with is a renewable source is, is better. At the moment we've used some offcuts from building which have you know, no other purpose and we've also sourced some of our um, firewood from this property and also from nearby forests in the way that is permitted. So it's clear enough now that we need to transition swiftly away from a fossil fuel energy economy to an economy based on renewable energy, not only due to climate change but also because in coming years or decades fossil energy production will inevitably peak and decline. Um, 
But we can't just green the supply of our energy. We also need to, I think, significantly reduce energy demand because there's no way that we can run a globalised, energy-intensive consumer society purely on renewable energy. Yes, we need to transition to 100% renewable energy, um, but that implies significantly reducing energy demand, and it would be far easier, obviously, to meet 100% renewable energy if we consumed much less energy, so that should be our goal. But given the close connection between energy and economy, a society based solely on renewable energy would have reduced energy supply and therefore would probably have to go through a phase of planned economic contraction, at least in the developed regions of the world. Um, so I think if we were successful in transitioning to 100% renewable energy, we wouldn't be able to live high consumption, energy intensive lifestyles. We would need to aim for far more humble but sufficient living standards. The silver lining to consuming less is actually consuming more of what we really want and what we really long for. And that includes, you know, handmade artisan products that, you know, most people treasure much more than some mass-produced product. It includes more time to breathe and to, to sing together, to dance together, to, to make things together. It's, there's a, a whole universe of things out there that we could do right now without money, but it requires the, the insight and the courage to connect to others and to form groups where we can change the I to a we. I rose up at the dawn of day, get thee away, get thee away, grace thou for riches, away, away, this is the front of mammon gray. Lunch is ready. Said I, this sure is very odd, I took to be the throne of God, for everything besides I need. much in the way of material things if you know that your neighbors have got your back and anytime you get overwhelmed by things you can go next door and there's someone whose shoulder you can cry on or they can come to you and and or someone whose tomatoes you can water then they're coming and helping you fix your bike or whatever it might be there are just so many advantages there are no disadvantages to building community and the potential advantages are absolutely massive so i think that's something we really really need to focus on I think the benefits of, of living in a community reveal themselves to you more and more each day. Um, there's the strict financial benefit of being able to share in the costs of, of making this transition. Um, and, uh, and also the benefits of being able to draw on each other's skills and attributes and knowledges. So you don't have to do it alone, you don't have to do it um, financially alone, skills alone. Some of those things are very intimidating for people trying to make that step. But, but more than that, it's about being, um, doing it together. And what's possible here is possible not just because of us as individuals, but because when we get this unique collection of individuals together, we're capable of so much more than what we would be on our own. Wow. That's insane. <laughs>
So we have to do one of two things. We either just accept that we have no community at all. We just have a casual neighborhood and some nice acquaintances at work and perhaps a couple people we drink with at the pub. Or we create community, intentional community. And I think that's the side that's always interested me personally as well as in my research is how can people create intentional community? How do you, how, can you consciously do it? I know people subconsciously do it all the time. I mean, it's our natural position, but can you actually do this? Can you set out to create this? And that always fascinates me. You're going to have to come up with some idea of how you're going to make decisions. Um, yes, we're going to have consensus, and yes, we're going to live lightly on the land, and yes, we're going to support each other, and yes, we'll look after each other's children and elderly and all of that sort of stuff. But it depends whether they have any experience with doing that. I think the other thing is that we are losing so many of those skills for living in community. It's like, you know, I know that I have to develop skills in organic gardening if I'm going to become an organic gardener. I know that. So therefore, I also have to develop skills in interhuman, interpersonal relationships if I'm going to live in community. Don't assume you're kind of born with that, uh, because you weren't. Uh, you have to learn how to cooperate and how to put the group above the individual. And that, that's very challenging. It's been a lot of challenges, yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Um, I think, although we had to live the first you know, few months without much infrastructure, without a warm kitchen space, without um, much of a lounge room, or without um, a whole lot of running water, and we had, to, had a composting toilet that was sort of outside, um, I don't think the infrastructure challenges are all that big. I think um, there seemed to be a sense of solidarity and like all doing it together and that kind of gave me a lot of comfort, um, knowing that we're all kind of pulling through and stronger because of it. So I feel like the infrastructure challenges were a little bit problematic, but um, yeah, they weren't as hard I think as the um, community challenges that we faced when uh, there was conflict in the community and. Um, our conflict resolution processes around that weren't fully developed, so um, yeah, I think I struggled a lot when things were not going well and people left and things weren't fully resolved, or when there was substantial difference in the direction that people wanted to take in the project, whether people wanted to build lots of infrastructure or start practicing simple, simpler living. Um, I feel like those sort of chasms, those divides were challenging me for me because I didn't really know where I sat and didn't know how to bring the group back together again. I wanted everyone to sort of start working together again. But. Obviously starting a, a community from scratch with people who don't really know each other at all and, um, and designing a property and um, finishing buildings, houses and bits of infrastructure um, is very challenging in um, the context of a one year project. So yeah, uh, that, that social aspect of just getting to know each other and, um, and getting decision-making processes in place has been one of the, the key challenges. Another major challenge I think has been the group figuring out how to accommodate a wide range of um, people's styles of voluntary simplicity. Um, it can be interpreted um, to differing degrees and there's not necessarily any right or wrong answers. So just figuring out how the group can accommodate um, the variety within our personal direction and preferences um, has also been a challenging component of that social side of things. One of the humbling learnings I got from being here was how difficult it is to be in community and how in a way we have to relearn that art that we have broken that long tradition of shared ritual and song and mythology and living in one place and knowing that history that's kind of been fragmented for us and when we now come together in groups it's much harder to find that common culture to draw upon in times of discord and in times of confusion. So it's easy for us to fragment back into our individual desires and paths. And I know that for lots of people, 
as resources become more scarce and we have to rely on each other more, there'll be positives to that, but there'll also be a lot of challenges. So I'm very motivated now to keep practicing and developing those skills of communication, conflict resolution, naming the difficulties, bringing up the emotional challenges, um, and also celebrating together, creating, relaxing, learning how to play and dance in a group and it's a, it's a real, it's the art of being human and the art of being together. <laughs> We've been living in a tent, we were living in a tent at the start of the year um, and yeah uh, like the tent was in a place where it didn't get a whole lot of sun and as it started to rain a bit more coming into winter it, um, it didn't really dry out so it started to get mouldy so um, yeah, we, there was a bit of pressure on us to do something else and we decided that building a really small house with recycled materials would be the simplest and most economical way to do that. And um, yeah, so we did. beautiful structure behind us is the house that we built uh, over the course of about three months out of um, pretty much entirely recycled materials. We had to make five purchases. Uh, we bought some cement for the foundations, some steel bracing tape because it was a bit wonky. Um, we bought some screws for the roof. We bought some... Um, wood tub of wood, wood glue. A little tub of wood glue for, to make some window frames. And what was the other thing we bought? We bought chains to hold the windows open. Um, oh, and we bought the six things. We bought some hinges as well. Um, but that's it, everything else is um, recycled materials we got um, entirely for free. Um, yeah, we went by um, dumpsters from demolition sites, um, we looked on the website Gumtree and yeah, we ended up getting yeah, pretty much everything we needed to build a whole house just um, for free. If yeah, we can demonstrate that it's possible to do without um, three and a half years of training and without tens of thousands of dollars um, to build a house that is going to be a lot better uh, in terms of its ecological footprint. Um, then I think that that can kind of disperse that knowledge more amongst the people that might not have the money to uh, take part in a more conventional sustainability movement. Yeah. So the total cost of the house is about four hundred and twenty dollars if you include um, yeah the petrol money that went into it and mm. yeah it's a lot more time consuming doing it for free but um, yeah it's definitely worth it. Mm. A lot more rewarding I think. Yeah. So while I've been at Warakan I've been continuing to work um, for eight hours a week um, in, um, for book publishing clients and that's enabled me to cover the small expenses that we have at Warakan. So we've put $30 a week into the kitty which is you know, the, the great benefit of living in a community um, that for $30 a week each we've been able to pretty much feed ourselves for the entire year and obviously all of us um, have little extras that we like um, that weren't um, items that everybody wanted and so we've bought our own cheese or, um, or bread. I think I'm right in saying that we've all spent under $100 a week um, this year for our basic living costs. And the borrower receives the full amount and pays it back, plus interest. Either way, the interest that it collects on loans is one of the bank's principal sources of income. Now Mr. Morton has obtained his loan. He has increased his bank credit by nearly $2,000. But this credit was not transferred to him from some other account. So where did it come from? So currently uh, the existing monetary system essentially has a growth imperative built into its structures because banks 
create money by loaning it into existence as interest-bearing debt. And in order for that debt to be paid back, plus the interest, that implies an expansion of the monetary system. Um, so it needs growth for stability, but we also know that growth is the driving force behind our environmental problems. So if we were to trans transition to a post-growth economy, as we, we need to do for environmental reasons, this would require us to create a different type of monetary and banking system, one that wasn't so dependent on growth. And I think there's a huge amount that governments can do to rein in the worst aspects of the current monetary system, but perhaps a more promising line of opposition, given that governments don't seem to be doing much, would be for individuals and households to try to uh, create new forms of economy, try to escape the existing monetary system as far as possible. And they could do this through things like creating local currencies, uh, local exchange networks, and engaging in uh, practices like barter and gift and sharing. It would be it's obviously so much easier for a community to deal with the contracting economy if communities and households shared the stuff that they had. Yeah, you have to uh, hug too. Do you want to get in here? Uh, no, I'm an observer at the moment. Addy. No. Addy. 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 Of what felt like a long process of learning to, to communicate with each other, and it's um, immensely satisfying now to to feel that that process has actually been really um, successful, and to to be living now in a um, with a community of people who, when problems arise, know how to work through them, and I think we've actually been really successful um, at making those at developing those communication skills. And it's a nice feeling when you know when we have a meeting and someone raises an issue, and um, you, you, you can see the um, the change, and you can see the different way that people approach it. You can see the different ways that people sort of think about, um, respond to um, issues, especially if, if where at the beginning of the year they might have felt a little bit attacked. Now they now they think through the the, the reason for the um, the issue coming up and. Yeah, I think we're all much better at, I think we're probably all in some way more mature community dwellers. Hey Reeves, ready? Angry pumpkin. Oh, Ruby. Just joking. Living in such close quarters with um, other people as part of a community, um, especially on quite a small scale where we all use the same lounge room and kitchen and there's, you know, seven or eight of us in that same space on a daily basis. Um, it certainly presents a lot of challenges on a personal and a, a group level um, that are just inherent to human beings and, um, you know, families and communities and all types of human relationships. So it's certainly been challenging, but um, I know for myself that's made me look inward and examine my own um, personal journey and where I'm at and um, how my own psychology is evolving and, and just, you know, if, if you feel a bit down one day or feel a bit anxious about some, how someone else is acting, um, it's ended up kind of flipping around and making me examine how I'm contributing to those sorts of dynamics or social situations and just, yeah, trying to learn more about myself, I guess. Happy birthday to you. What is him? building my house in, in less than a week now. I've got 14 people coming out um, to learn how to build a tiny house on wheels and uh, I've been gathering materials for the last couple of months uh, in Melbourne and around the local area um, to build a tiny house on wheels out of recycled materials. You know we've got a few rough plans but being a, a tiny house it's quite easy to go with the flow and it, being recycled materials we've had to adapt to that and it's, uh, it's going to be a bit of a, a jigsaw puzzle, I guess.
because there's a major, major benefit if you don't get trapped into working 20, 30, 40 years to pay the mortgage on your two big McMansions, boy oh boy have you gained a lot of time and freedom from worry to do other things. And in the same world we would be able to build a very nice little house for I reckon $10,000 at most and you can do it for less than that if you like. And that's a perfectly adequate house. Now the, you've saved $400,000 there by the time you take in the time, the payment of interest and loans to the bank and tax on the money. That's not negligible. There is a benefit for moving to simpler ways. So we're, uh, we're three days into the workshop and uh, it's going really well. As you can see, we've got uh, the full timber frame of the walls up and uh, the group's working really well together. Uh, they're all learning off each other and, uh, and Nick, our carpenter, is doing a really great job. So uh, I feel very lucky to have everyone working so hard and, uh, and we're on schedule. I was really humbled by the, uh, the goodwill, the energy and all of the contributions brought by everyone who made it possible. Um, it was just an amazing week of everyone's energy vibing and making this beautiful house possible and uh, you know I've got a little bit left to do but I've basically had people come and build me a house with really great intentions and um, we all learnt a whole lot and um, it couldn't have gone any better. I'd say it was probably the best week of my life without a doubt. There's a whole history of these sort of energy descent ideas and permaculture being associated with a move to the country, uh, a move to rural areas as a place that's a better place to uh, be more self-reliant. And that still may be true, but for most people there's both a necessity and an advantage in looking at where they live already. And for most Australians that is some sort of detached housing in what we call suburbia, whether that's in our capital cities or whether it's in similar housing in our regional towns and even villages like the one we live in, that most people are living in those separate houses on, on, on small blocks. And what that template of living makes possible is it's possible to incrementally adjust what is happening there and provide a lot of people's needs by growing food, by modifying the house to make it more uh, less dependent on uh, energy, by harvesting some of the water and by using some of the space that exists in our relatively large houses to start doing more in the household economy doing things for ourselves rather than depending on money. One of the things that's most exciting about the Intentional Communities movement now is that it's, it's like we have right across the landscape hundreds of experiments about how to live in a way that confronts and resolves issues associated with climate change and peak oil, um, you know, environmental damage on, on, on a global scale. Um, Instead of just having a one-way solution, which just says this is the way that, that, that we have to go forward to resolve this, instead we've got all of these little uh, bubbles of creative responses and, and, and um, you know, new ways of, of, of living and being together and, and, and building lives together, patterns of settlement and patterns of production that are popping up all over across the landscape, each offering different pathways. And it's, it's, it's almost like the, the, as, as more of these emerge, we have more opportunities for resilience. Ideally I'd like to see more initiatives like this um, where people uh, with resources and land and spaces um, making them available to uh, allow you know passionate and enthusiastic people uh, to live more self-sufficiently and um, demonstrate through example that um, there are other ways of doing things. So there's so much that we can do right now 
uh, without spending any money to greatly enrich our lives. And let's not be fooled by, um, by this idea that we have so much choice in the, in the modern economy and that uh, our lives would be so limited if we were to choose a different path. We, we have not even begun to explore the potential for more diversified, localized ways of doing things. There are reasons for pessimism because it's a big, big task and we're in a lot of bother and um, we are not very far down the path to the kind of consciousness that we need. But there are a lot of strong reasons for optimism. One is uh, that the vision of an alternative way is, I think, so attractive. That's what keeps me going. Um, and it's so easily done. We could do it in weeks if we wanted to. It's about moving to ways that would liberate all of us. You don't want to wait until you have absolutely no choice. So I, I would say it's a bit like we're standing on the edge of a cliff and we're going over the edge. Like it or not, we're going over the edge. That, that's not up for debate. So what are you going to do? Are you going to stand on the edge of that cliff and wait for someone to shove you off? Or are you going to put on your parachute and jump? Because not that base jumping is without its risks, but it's a lot less risky than going over the edge without a parachute. <laughs> so let's not think of it as good guys and bad guys. And let's not believe for a minute that the way we'll change it is by getting some good guys to go into those large structures. Let's look systemically at how we can shift towards smaller structures with more holistic knowledge underpinnings. And that really is the, the localizing path. When you know how to live simply, the sense of freedom can be just overwhelming. There's nothing as addictive as freedom, and there's nothing as attractive either. So I think if, if, we, if we find the right way to, to explain our ideas to people, and explain the ideas that are fundamentally workable in the first place, then there is so much that can be achieved. There's no need to despair. I came to Warakan wanting to explore a really radical form of voluntary simplicity because I felt a real sense of urgency around the various crises that the world is facing at the moment. And radical simplicity seems to me to be the best and most logical response. After the experience this year of living in community and despite all of the challenges, I feel really strongly that this is the right way for me to live. Um, so, yeah, my, my intention is to return to New Zealand and find or found a, a community. And in the long term, I'm really hoping to live in a community that operates in a gift economy. That feels like a right and responsible way to live or, or, or thing to work towards. The, the person I was at the start of the year is vastly different to the person I am at the end of the year. Um, as I would hope would be the case for every other year of the rest of my life. My plans for the future extend as far as I should probably pick that zucchini over there. Um, beyond that, not many plans, but um, I, I'm imagining that Rachel and I will probably stick around here at Warakan for a little while. Um, I'm feeling pretty settled here, it's feeling a lot like home. I think the number one thing that's been solidified in my mind this year is my favourite things in the world are imagination, creativity and teamwork um, and the combination of those three things is yeah, personally the recipe for living in a beautiful way in the future. I love community, I love other people, I love living and spending time with other people. I don't know whether or not living in an intentional community is part of my future. Um, one thing that I knew coming here was that um, living in community is a challenge. It involves effort and that that effort is worth it. Um, yeah, it's been a really transformational year for me. 
I did not expect to have the opportunity to be constructing my own house this year. So it's been very humbling um, to have the generosity of all the people involved and, and the landowner um, to allow me to do that because it's been quite a journey to um, collect the materials and go through the process of building over an extended period of time. Um, so that's just been fantastic and, and you know, blown my expectations out of the water. So once I finish building my house, which will be sometime early in 2016, I plan to relocate it to Melbourne, uh, hopefully in a backyard somewhere um, that affords me a location where I can ride my bike and catch public transport without having to be car reliant. Um, but after moving it to Melbourne and living there for a little while and enjoying a bit of city life, um, I don't really have a plan. Um, I'm very happy to have that feeling of freedom and liberation for the first time in my life and I'm going to make the most of that. I think one thing I get paralysed by is the sense of having to do it right, of somehow not making mistakes. And we've made so many mistakes living here. You know, there are buildings that are leaky, there are disagreements that never got resolved, there are um, contradictions in the way we're living and compromises that we had to make. So from one perspective, we failed. We haven't transformed the world or led this perfect example. And from another perspective, those very failings are our gifts and they are the offering and they are the learnings because we've risked and we've been willing to put our values on the line and we've been willing to test these ideas and try and bring them into the, you know, the shared reality. And, you know, no one holds the answers. No one has the perfect solution. It's going to require a response from everyone. If we're going to be moving towards a more wholesome and enduring way of life. And, um, you know, the challenges, the failings, the mistakes, the triumphs, they're all part of the story of change. And um, I just hope that other people can feel that encouragement to make their own mis beautiful mistakes on the way to on the way to integrity. Picture me standing in a forest fire, counting every